Self-identification is really tricky for me. I think we can all relate to that experience where you're asked to describe yourself in three words, and you don't really know what angle to take. You could highlight your best qualities, make commentary on your worst, or hopefully do a little bit of both. I find, however, that the answers I always give to these questions are seldom truthful, because any description of who I am that doesn't touch upon my queerness wouldn't be an accurate reflection of myself. Now, a few years ago, you would never hear me say that. I used to believe that my relationship with gender and sexuality didn't define me, and that it shouldn't define me. Back then, I believed that my essence and sense of self should be supplemented but never taken over by labels. And while that method of identification is fair and valuable, don't get me wrong, I also know that this is not how people see me. My queerness has always been something that was very, very visible, and I've never been able to escape it. Before I ever had the language to describe my sexuality or gender, everyone around me had already formed concrete, unshakable assumptions about who I am. Now, for the most part, this was extremely stressful. Being young and queer in an environment full of toxic masculinity and otherism, living this life of stealth was my goal. I used to deeply believe that the only way I could ever achieve true happiness was if I could be perceived as no different from my peers, and all of these assumptions threatened that lifestyle I had idealized. Now, not everyone around me has made these assumptions, however, and it's actually become quite shocking to see people be surprised about my identity. I remember one time during my freshman year, I casually mentioned liking this boy in front of a very sheltered acquaintance of mine. And he replied, "Oh my God, this changes everything." <laughs> Fortunately, when he came back over the weekend, he reported back to me that he spoke to his mom, who said that gay people are really funny, so everything was okay. Regardless of whether people guess that I'm queer or, in the rare case, that they're shocked to hear such a thing, one common trend remains: queerness, in the eyes of everyone around me, takes the front seat. Now, I want to take a quick break to note that everybody has their own definition of the word queer, and I would like to give you mine. To me personally, queerness can be described as an experience of ambiguity with gender and sexuality. I've had to come out several different times over the years, as my experience of attraction and my relationship with my gender have never really stayed stagnant. Even though I can't say I feel represented by the same labels I maybe used in middle school, these experiences were so real and valuable in my trajectory of understanding who I am today.、And、the word queer has a charming ambiguity that encompasses all of that. As you can all probably assume by my readiness to label myself as queer, I am quite proud of my identity, and that was a very hard place to arrive at. Before I ever could fully accept myself and reach this place of true. Um, understanding and acceptance, I was hindered by my own bitterness surrounding how lonely I felt. I found that even in the most open of spaces, there's this metaphysical veil separating me and my world from others, which is especially true in my academic experiences. The most perfect example of this is through a kind of turbulent experience I had at a group bonding retreat. The dorming for our houses were gendered, which for me was utterly terrifying. Historically speaking, I don't really jive too well with boys, and the idea of having to stay with this huge group of them sounded like something straight out of a nightmare. Despite this, I tried, but a group of them were saying offensive things about me in the room next door, and I had just been made to feel unsafe and a little unwelcomed, like I knew that something like this would happen, and I had let my guard down just to be a reminder of why this very guard exists. Come our next retreat, I'm supposed to stay with my girlies, but we were informed while setting up our room that my staying with them was a legal liability. The retreat center's best option was to put me in this little shed off the side of the house. Now, <laughs> this yeah.、Um, now, the shed had no service, so I couldn't really text my friends about how sad I was.、Uh, the heater was turned on way too high. So I was sweating despite it being winter, and it was on this like empty, rusty bunk bed. I think its creaks broke the decibel scale.、Um, now, while here, I couldn't escape this debilitating feeling of confinement. 
I had just watched um, all of my closest friends sitting around in this circle where they're spilling tea and watching movies, and I couldn't partake in this. And I also had just watched all of the boys playing cards, joking around, and flaunting this circle of brotherhood that I would never be let into. Now, I'm not telling this story to be maudlin. I'm telling this because it's a perfect representation of the physical separation between myself and my non-queer counterparts. This imaginary veil separating me and my experiences from theirs is often quite palpable. And this experience is so fueled by gender. The boys I've known for over a decade still prefer to stay away from me, afraid that my queerness could rub off on them like a disease. And by default, most of my friends have been girls. But it's quite clear that in many cases, my identity has curbed closeness. I can ultimately say that I've spent most of my life being labeled as too outwardly feminine for boys and too intrinsically masculine for girls, a categorization which has fueled and upheld this veil for my entire life. Now, as most of this occurred in schools or in academic spaces, I can't help but blame some of my past instructors for their contribution to this otherness. School is, at its core, a space we go to learn and to be socialized, and part of that experience requires teaching students about identity and exhibiting cultural competency. I have seen my peers grow over the years from awkward conversations about identity, and I have watched students cultivate their empathetic tendencies and understandings of social justice from teacher-led discussions. During my first year of high school, our ELA department's entire roster of books was about identity, which is exactly the direction we should be heading in. But I've also noticed that queer identities are rarely brought up in these conversations, and queer themes were never explored in these literatures. I now, for the first time, have an openly queer teacher, and they are helping students grow. Students who hurled offensive slurs at me over the years are now asking questions about non-binary identities and sitting underneath the trans pride flag during class. While I'm not saying that a teacher's choice to discuss queer themes in the classroom is what will solve homophobia or transphobia, I am saying that students need a space to learn about these issues outside of Jerry Springer or their family's biases, which is what most of my generation had growing up. I can say with a lot of confidence that if any one of my teachers from my elementary to middle school years taught a simple lesson about homophobia or transphobia being innately wrong, my experiences in school would have been drastically different. But I understand why teachers try to avoid these conversations. Directly after the Pulse nightclub shooting, I was heartbroken. Any time a catastrophic event took place, my school would host a moment of silence in the morning, and teachers would talk about what happened throughout the day, offering support where it was needed and asking students how they felt. The shooting took place on a Sunday, so I came in the next day fully prepared to unpack all of its layers, but the morning announcements passed by without a moment of silence, and the day went on without any, ha any talk of what happened over the weekend. I expressed to my teacher how hurt everyone's silence made me, and he asked me to stay after chat with him. While there, he went on to express that he specifically avoided this topic because he knew that certain students wouldn't handle it with sufficient maturity, and he didn't want that to impact students who were genuinely affected by the shooting. Now, my snarky friend told him to take the LGBT ally sticker off his door if he was going to act that way, and we ended our conversation. But the next day, he came into school and he apologized. Explaining that our conversation made him understand more about students' needs, he promised to use this experience to fuel the way he teaches in the future. When I started high school, he started the GSA. He worked to give students access to queer literature in the school library, and he took on this role of active allyship and I could have asked for nothing more. Now, I'm not saying that every single person should use what this one teacher did as a model for their own allyship, but I am saying that allies need to be more active across the board. Whether you are a teacher navigating how to construct the right safe spaces in the classroom, a student noticing the lack of queer themes in your history or ELA curriculum, or even a parent noticing a child struggling, I implore you to speak up ask questions, even if it feels awkward, and see what you personally can do to make sure that the spaces you inhabit are comfortable and accessible for everyone in your life. And if they aren't, try to change that. If everybody adopts this mindset, no one person will have to overexert themselves fighting this fight, and the burden to deconstruct the veil, which has existed for far too long, will no longer fall on the backs of the queer community. Thank you.